Well, greetings and welcome to Faith Connections. I'm grateful that you've joined us today because today's lesson is a great lesson. It's a lesson about the Apostle Paul in the city of Corinth. And it's a story that inspires all of us to be faithful in sharing our story, our, our gospel story, to keep speaking the gospel truth. So this city, the city of Corinth, dates back to 3500 BC. And it attracted a wide variety, a, a diversity of people because of its, um, its strategically located with two harbors. And at the height of the Greek Empire, 776 to 323 BC, Corinth became a great city. It was so great that it eclipsed even Athens in its prominence. After the Romans destroyed Corinth in 146 BC, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city in 44 BC and established it as a Roman colony. The city quickly regained its popularity and prominence and became the largest and most prosperous city in Greece. When Paul arrives in Corinth during his second missionary journey around 50 AD, Corinth was a major Roman city with about 100,000 in population in and around the city. Now, Corinth is a very wealthy city. It's philosophical, it's religious, it's entertaining, and it's immoral. It's, um, it is an influential city of the first century. Uh, located at the crossroads between the East and the West, Corinth represents the very best and the very worst that a city has to offer. But despite the challenges, Paul recognized the city of Corinth as a great opportunity to evangelize and expand the gospel. So when we look at our communities, we might think the same thing that, hey, it's a, it's a tough place, but really the Lord strategically places us. And the Lord so strategically placed the apostle Paul that he would spend the next 18 months working and evangelizing this very important and strategic city. I want to read for you, it's Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 18, as we discover the story of Paul's ministry in the city of Corinth. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, Crispus, a synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Now, while Gallio was proconsul of Acadia, of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made 
a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Galio showed no concern what, whatever. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centrea because of a vow he had taken. So let's explore that scripture just a little and see what it might have to say to you and me. In Corinth, Paul, in Corinth, Paul met the, this Jewish couple named Aquila and Priscilla, who were tent makers by trade. And they had moved to Corinth because the emperor Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. The Bible doesn't tell us how, how uh, this couple became believers. We just know they were. But there was a natural connection between Paul and these tent makers because Paul too was a tent maker. And while living or ministering in Corinth, Paul lived and worked with Aquila and Priscilla in their tent making business. So Hey, it could be that Paul was the first bivocational preacher while he was ministering in Corinth. I'd like to say there are, in our own district, there are many wonderful bivocational pastors who work a job every day and then take on the responsibility of being a pastor, of caring for a flock and preaching every Sunday and doing all the things that are required. And I would just say to you, that is no easy task. And as you think about the day, that today, why not offer a prayer for those pastors and their families? Uh, that'd be a great, that's a great action step in this lesson today. So as it was though, for Paul, when he moved to a new city, he would go to the synagogue and share the gospel working during the week. Paul shared the gospel every Sabbath in the synagogue, trying to reason and persuade Jews and Gentiles to believe in Christ. Uh, Paul found a way to witness for Christ through his work as well as his preaching. So let's pause there too. When you go to work every day, there's a great opportunity for you to witness to, for Jesus. Yeah, and sometimes we can't do it with words, but how we live and how we respond and care for people can be a powerful opportunity for us to tell others about, about, about Jesus. And I encourage you to do that. Well, Paul keeps on speaking. And in the midst of that, he encounters persecution, and opposition. Uh, the scripture says that Silas and Timothy came to join Paul in Corinth, and from that moment on, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So it could have been that his companions had brought funding that would allow Paul to commit himself to full-time preaching. Uh, they probably also encouraged Paul. Their presence there probably also encouraged Paul and emboldened him with a fresh new energy and, and to concentrate on sharing the gospel. Hey, I'd even say to you, never underestimate the power of your encouragement. I've said often, I know as a pastor, I don't always get it right, but I can tell you at my heart is, is a desire 
to serve the Lord and to help other people discover the power of what it means to live for Jesus. So I'm grateful for those um, words of encouragement that you often speak, and I thank you for that. So what we know about Paul's preaching and why it ruffled feathers is that he was proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. The Jews were, well, their opposition became abusive. And so Paul says, hey, I'm, my primary focus from this point forward is going to be to Gentiles who are more, who are much more receptive than you are. As believers, we have an obligation to witness um, about our faith. Now, we can't force people to believe, and sometimes people will reject our message, but our responsibility is to witness. That's our responsibility. We can't uh, determine what others do with the message, but we must proclaim the message. So that's verses 5 and 6, and then we get to verses 7 through 11. Paul begins to focus his ministry on the Gentiles, and it says, leaving the synagogue, Paul went next door to the home of Titius Justus. Paul's ministry among the Gentile Corinthians found great success, and many people believed and were baptized. Even Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire family responds to Paul's message about Jesus. But despite his success, Paul was in, in danger and afraid. But Paul had been there before. He, he had faced similar opposition in other cities. Uh, and when he, he was attacked, he was often thrown out of town. So it's not, just not, not surprising to discover to, that Paul was a little worried and anxious about the opposition that he was encountering. But the Bible says in our passage day, at nighttime, the Lord spoke to him and reassured him and encouraged him to continue his ministry. God urged Paul to put aside his fear. He literally says, do not continue to fear and to continue to persist in spreading the gospel message in Corinth. Moreover, the Lord promised his presence and protection. I think that's fitting because we began a prayer initiative today, and it is a prayer for God's hand of protection. It is a prayer for a new revelation from the Lord. And with those words of encouragement, with that promise of the Lord, Paul remained in Corinth for 18 months teaching the word of God. So despite opposition, we as believers can rest confidently in God's ability to carry out his plan and protect his children. That should give us a new dose of energy. Well, we come to the closing verses of this passage, and in an effort to sort of ramp up the the opposition of the persecution, the Jews mount a legal attack against Paul and brought him before the Roman governor, Galio. They said, hey, this, this guy, he's, he's persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our laws. Now, this is significant. It's a significant legal challenge, and we should not overlook it. Because if the Jews could persuade Galio to rule against Paul's preaching, it would literally ban Christianity or the Christian faith throughout the entire Roman Empire. But even before Paul could begin his defense, Galio says, case dismissed. This has nothing to do with me. Um, deal with him yourself. <laughs> God's protective hand. And even though the crowd turned on the synagogue leader in protest and began to beat him in front of Galio, he showed no concern. So in this way, Paul and the Christian gospel scored a, a 
a, a significant victory over the opposition. Scott Rainey, who is the director of Sunday School Ministries for the Church of the Nazarene, shares this lesson online every week as well. I often listen to that as I prepare to spend our time together. In his lesson, he told a story about an opportunity while pastoring that he was invited to pray a prayer at a Memorial Day gathering. And he received a request, an email from the persons who were in who were organizing the event and said, hey, we need your prayer in advance. And so he, he gave them an outline of his prayer and it wasn't long before he received an email uh, from the person in charge and said, hey, your prayer is unacceptable. Uh, you can't pray in Jesus name. And so you're gonna need to change your prayer. Well, somehow a group of attorneys found out about, about the situation and offered to represent him and said, hey, Let's, 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 let's challenge their decision. And the bottom line is, is that they won. And Scott was allowed to pray, and he was allowed to pray in Jesus' name. Well, that's a powerful, uh, that's a powerful declaration for us, isn't it? That you and I have been called to share the good news of the gospel. And throughout this lesson today, we have been reminded that we should continue to speak, that we should allow God to work in us and through us. So what I want you to do this week is I want you to consider ways that you might share the good news in the most unlikely places. Hey, think about it. I mean, if you were, if you were the Apostle Paul and looking for a, for a church to pastor, wouldn't you say, hey, send me a place where there's, there's lots of Christian people and there's no opposition? But that was not so in the city of Corinth. This would be a challenge to share the good news. It, the city would challenge the opportunity to share the good news. But Paul thought that's exactly who needs to hear the good news. Who will you be around this week who needs to hear the good news? Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. I'm looking forward to our time together this Sunday as we launch our prayer initiative, praying our way to Pentecost.